I'm Tim Machado. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Stanford University, working in the laboratory of Carl Dyseroff. Have you ever found yourself doing something like going to your kitchen for a midnight snack and then stopped and wondered how you ended up doing that? What was going on in your mind at that moment? That's what I'm studying in my project, how you make those kinds of decisions. So people have been studying decision making in mice and humans and other organisms for the past few decades, and we've learned a lot. But most of that research has focused on frontal lobe circuits. So we know now that there are neurons in this part of our brain that encode information about evidence integrated over time and plan actions before they take place. And while we've learned a lot from those kinds of studies, we also know that that's just a small component of a much larger puzzle that spans our entire brain. So if we take a step back and ask what's on the other end of the spectrum, it's not up in cortex. It's down in our spinal cord and our brain stem. And we look at a whole other class of decision-making circuits called reflexes. You might be familiar with one of them called the patellar reflex. So the doctor's testing where they hit your knee with a hammer. The point of that test is to probe the integrity of a very simple neural circuit that monitors muscle stretch and then relays that back into the spinal cord. If the circuit is intact, your knee will twitch when the hammer hits your knee. It doesn't sound like this is a decision, maybe. But it definitely is. It's a default decision that your spinal cord makes for you, a default decision to move. It's a decision because if you wanted to, you could resist the urge to move and not move, or even to excessively move if that was your choice. And why does that happen? Well, because this reflex circuit is only one small piece of the puzzle. There are other circuits down to the spinal cord all the way up to cortex that are kind of like nested loops that all fit together in order to have us make this very simple action. So if we want to understand what's going on, we need to measure different layers at the same time. So this is the focus of my work. I'm looking at complex decision making, or even simple decision making, as this kind of nested set of loops, and try to record from these different layers in mice to understand the principles that bind these different things together so that they can collaborate or compete to make decisions in different ways, depending on the behavioral state of the animal. The way I'm doing this, primarily at first, is by using an optical imaging technique that allows us to record from thousands of neurons across the cortex at the same time. By using this technique, we can simultaneously observe the behavior of a mouse and then try to decode how these behaviors relate to the neural activity that we see and learn something about the neural computation that's going on. The specific behavior that we're using is actually kind of an odd one, but I'll explain it quickly. A mouse is head restrained in front of three different water spouts. And it's a thirsty mouse that wants to lick to get water from one of these spouts. But to make this more difficult, the spout that dispenses water changes over time. So for 10 or so trials in a row, 10 to 15 trials, the water comes out of one spout, and then it'll randomly switch to another one. There's no indication to the mouse that this is happening. They just have to figure this out for themselves. So if they want to maximize the amount of water they get, the best strategy is for them to remember where they got reward last time and then lick to that spout again on the next trial. It turns out that mice can learn how to do this, and this presents an opportunity. We can use our imaging technique to actually try to decode from different areas in cortex with our microscope which regions in cortex represent this memory of the mouse. And it turns out that it's not just motor areas. It's areas all over the place. And they all have kind of a detailed action plan of what the mouse is going to do in the future. This is beyond what we had expected, thinking that maybe there would be a bias more towards motor areas versus, say, a visual area that doesn't seem to have anything first order to do with the task. So to put it another way, we can decode what the mouse is going to do seconds in the future from data taken when the mouse isn't moving at all. So this is pretty cool, I think. But what does it tell us? I think what it says is that it seems like there's this pretty distributed activity pattern that might mean something. But to really test whether it means anything or has any causal significance, we have to take things a step further. To do that, we're using another technique that was developed in my mentor's lab called optogenetics. Optogenetics lets us use light to turn off different parts of cortex and then look at the impact on behavior. And what we found was shutting down areas all over cortex, not just areas that we would think would be necessarily super involved, all had some impact on the mouse's ability to perform this task. 
again suggesting that in contrast to previous studies, brain areas and cortex are not just doing one prescribed function for, say, encoding speech or sound or movement. They're also, at the same time, representing the future and making predictions about what's going to happen. So what about the rest of the brain? I talked before at the beginning of the talk about how there's all these layers going all the way up from cortex to down into the spinal cord. And to this point, I've just been talking about cortex. How do we get at those places? To do that, we're using another set of techniques, long, thin electrical probes that we can use to supplement these imaging techniques that only let us look at the surface of the brain. And then we can actually record from these reflexive circuits at the same time. By doing this, we can finally start to look at how these different pieces fit together. And my big hope is that we're going to see that different strategies are used, different combinations of these circuits might give rise to the same action as a function of whether the mouse is, say, hungry or tired or thirsty. And I think that would be pretty profound, because that would, something, that would tell us something about the processes that give rise to action. It would say that the brain works in a flexible way to generate behaviors using different pieces of the brain, maybe even entirely different parts of the brain, depending on the state of the animal. Taking a step back, we're excited also, not just because we can ask these basic science questions, but because they might also serve as a platform for asking questions about disease. This experiment I talked about shutting down different regions of cortex in some crude way is somewhat analogous to having a stroke. What happens when you shut down part of the brain? How does the rest of the brain compensate? Those kinds of questions and the underlying principles that we can learn about will tell us something about how to develop future therapies to treat things like stroke, or analogously in the brain stem, something like ALS might you know, also benefit from these kinds of studies. So through this whole technique, we're learning a lot about how the brain can adapt flexibly to changing environment by changing the strategies it uses to generate movement. And looking forward, we're excited to see how this all fits together and learn the trick that the brain uses to do this all so well.